Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Alex Titus. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. The definition of ending for one population looks like there are fewer people experiencing homelessness. So first, that requires you to know at any given time how many people are experiencing homelessness, which is often one of the biggest challenges in communities. But the number of people experiencing homelessness at any given time is less than that community's ability, demonstrated ability to house people monthly. I think in the past, technology has been more of an obstacle to communities ending homelessness than it has been an accelerant. And I think one of our strategic aims is how do we ensure technology is clearing the path for communities not standing in the way. All right, folks. Uh, So today we had Lori Kelly from the Joint Office of Homelessness Services, uh, uh, which is a partnership between Multnomah County and the city of Portland, as well as Beth Sandor from the national organization Community Solutions. And this is an episode where we focus really exclusively on homelessness. Um, and the reason why we asked Beth and Lori to join was because some of you have read this. It was in the in the liftoff. I'll link to it in the show notes. But Willamette Week had an article a couple weeks ago. Uh, the title was, Could Portland End Homelessness with a By Name Directory of People Living Outside? Question mark. Officials are going to try, period. Uh, and it was an article that raised a lot of eyebrows and had a lot of people talking, um, in part because of this question of like, whoa, the government's going to have a directory by name of everyone who's homeless. Um, So it was this like perceived to be uh, controversial by a lot of folks in the political world. As you'll hear in this conversation, it might not be as controversial as you think. Uh, In fact, the list that uh, is sort of a version of the list that was described in the in the article, and the article actually says this later down, is already in existence and has been for years. It's actually a federal requirement. Um, but the art, but the conversation we have with um, Lori and Beth uh, spans a lot more than just the question of the list. Um, there are examples across the country where homelessness is actually being ended in specific populations. Um, and they've got this theory of the case that they're going to try to apply to Portland um, that they think will help us uh, eventually eliminate homelessness in the community, um, which is really exciting. And so, yeah, Alex, I'm curious your thoughts. Uh, you were the ones you were the one who wanted to reach out to these folks to schedule this interview. What did you think? Yeah, just first off, in regards to the list, uh, that was very misconstrued in the article. As she stated, there is already, and I mean, you you could disagree with this, right? There's already government lists, both federally on the state level, at the county level, and at the city level of tracking homeless folks in terms of you know information that's being gathered and things like that. So you could definitely disagree with that approach, but the Community Solutions Group is basically just taking existing government data and building a business intelligence tool on top of it to try to inform to make better decisions. So uh, I don't think that that was well betrayed. Uh, and I hope that we did a better job of cleaning some of that stuff up. And you'll even see through the episode, they corrected a number of the questions and answers that I had come to uh, immediately. So I think that was really insightful. And then, uh, yeah, as you stated during the episode, this is really our first deep dive we've done on homelessness. I learned a lot. Uh, it's clearly a a very interesting issue just from the money level too, in terms of how counties, how cities get funding, what that looks like and things like that. So I thought it was a really interesting episode and a big deep dive. I definitely learned a lot. Last thing I'll say, uh, our audience is mostly elected officials, lobbyists, staff, um, some students in campaign interns. What I will say is if you want or hope to be a leader in Oregon in the 2020s, you have to be fluent on the issue of homelessness. It's not, this isn't something that we can just have be specialized to a small group of people. Like the problem is so pervasive across the state that I just think it's really important that everyone has a base level understanding of all the complex dynamics, some of which we talk about today, some of which we don't actually talk about today. Um, So hopefully this is informative and helpful for folks as they're building their fluency like I am uh, on the issue of, of homelessness. And hopefully we'll have more episodes like this in the future where we can do deep dives and help um, help build policy fluency for listeners. Um, but with that, thank you all for subscribing. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for supporting the podcast and our newsletter. And let's jump into the interview with Lori and Beth. All right, Beth Sandor and Lori Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How are you guys today? I'm great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Doing well, thank you. 
So um, as, uh, as we described in the introduction to this episode, the reason why we reached out to you two and we're so excited to talk to you is because there was this long uh, Willamette Week article that sort of introduced uh, community solutions uh, to the Oregon political world. Obviously, it's been something that city and county officials have been working on um, for over a year now, but it was a controversial article. There's a lot in it. Um, and so we're fortunate to have someone both from the National Community Solutions and someone who works locally on implementation of this program to help kind of explain what it does, uh, why it's been in the news, and what your hopes and vision are um, for the coming months and years. Um, so before we jump into the article, though, um, Beth, why don't you kick us off? Can you give us a little bit about your personal background uh, and how you found your way to uh, Community Solutions? Sure. Um, so I... Um, started with Community Solutions kind of before we were Community Solutions. We started um, as a, a nonprofit based in New York City that was developing uh, permanent supportive housing, again, for people who were formerly homeless. Um, and then I've just been on the, the same journey the organization has been on in evolving our theory of change around how we end homelessness. And so I've been doing this work since 1998. Um, and now today I lead Built for Zero, which is an effort of community solutions. And so before we go over to Lori, can you give us the, the summary overview of what is the mission and vision of um, your organization? Sure, the, the community solutions, our mission is a lasting end to homelessness that leaves no one behind. Um, and we do that through working with communities to measurably and equitably and sustainably end homelessness. Awesome. And so, Lori, you're not officially with uh, Community Solutions, but you obviously work with um, their model in the local context. Tell us about your background and how you arrived at the joint office. Sure. Um, so I've been at the Joint Office of Homeless Services about a year. Um, I'm their planning and evaluation manager here, and I'm also the community lead in Multnomah County for Built for Zero. Um, but I come here actually through, I'd say like, oh gosh, like 15 or 20 years now of working in homeless services, mostly on the healthcare and homeless side. So in clinics like Central City Concern, which is a local uh, agency here and outside in, but then also more recently, at the Oregon Health Authority for a couple of years in policy and planning, specifically with a focus on housing and behavioral health. So um, it's kind of interesting because I think when you come from healthcare, uh, you're used to a lot of information systems working with um, uh, services and needs to coordinate things. So I tend to um, come at it from that angle a little bit, but it's actually been really helpful to think of it from that framework of how you where you do personal and where you do aggregate data and how you use data to do services. So um, that's my general background. And then um, since I got here, I've been jumping into the Built for Zero work along with other work that we're doing to really make our data um, more transparent and more utilizable um, to get our services going. Awesome. And so a couple quick questions on community, or maybe they're not quick, um, on community <laughs> solutions. Um, the article mentions uh, this, I think it was a hundred million dollar grant that the MacArthur Foundation, which is the, the organization that um, people know them as the Genius Grant um, mm -hmm. organization. Can you tell us first, like, how did you win an award of a hundred million dollars and how do you spend a hundred million dollars? Um, tell us a little bit about that caught my eye. And so I'm interested in if, if there's a backstory and what the plan is to utilize that money. Yeah, that's a great question. So we launched Built for Zero in 2015, um, as you know, uh, to figure out how to move away from counting up to outcomes like housing placements, instead work with communities to count down to zero. And for the first five years of this effort, we worked with about 75, 80 communities nationally on figuring that out together with some you know, we had some theories about how we would do that work together. And incredibly, over that first five years, um, we have seen 14 communities and homelessness for um, one or more populations. And we, together with the communities that we have been working with in the, over the last seven years, have really figured out some core components of methodology that we see um, that is laying the foundation to really build systems that can drive reductions and ultimately end homelessness. And so um, the MacArthur um, Hunter and Change Award is really uh, an opportunity to figure out how we can take this work to scale. So what, what are we learning? What do we still need to work learn? And how do we bring that to um, communities all across the US, every type of community and demonstrate it's possible not only to do this and 
small rural community, but a medium-sized urban community or a large suburban community. And so the work of the next five years with the investment um, from MacArthur and, and many other funders is to really um, accelerate progress to move from 14 communities ending homelessness to uh, 50 communities ending homelessness and demonstrate what's possible and change the public narrative um, that ending homelessness is possible in our reach. Um, one definitional question, um, and this they talk about this in the article, but um, and you you've you've described quote ending homelessness for yeah. certain populations. Definitionally, what does ending homelessness mean from the community solutions perspective in a given community or among a given population? Yeah, Let, uh, I will tell you what it means, and I want to just pull up for a second about why that matters. Um, because the in in our journey, when we launched Built for Zero, what became clear is that there were these national kind of intention to end homelessness, but there weren't measurable definitions of what that meant. How would we know a uh, community had ended homelessness? And how do we create a definition that's simple to understand, that's objectively measurable across context so that if... Phoenix, Arizona ends homelessness. It means the same thing that when um, Rockford, Illinois ends homelessness and that kind of consistency across. And I think maybe that was because when we launched this effort, the idea that you would end homelessness was more of a concept than a, than a, a, a true belief that we could get to a measurable end. And so that is why we have defined it very, very clearly is so that collectively we can all be holding ourselves accountable and working intentionally toward that aim. And so the definition of ending for one population looks like there are fewer people experiencing homelessness. So first that requires you to know at any given time how many people are experiencing homelessness, um, which is often one of the biggest challenges in communities, but that the number of people experiencing homelessness at any given time is less than that community's ability, demonstrated ability to house people monthly. So for example, if a community has 10 veterans experiencing homelessness across their community, they would have to have demonstrated over the last six months that on average, every single month they can house at least 10 veterans. And what that's trying to get at is that you have built a system that can ensure that homelessness is rare um, that it doesn't happen uh, very often to people. And that when it does happen, it's brief, that your experience of homelessness is 30 days or 45 days and you move out of it very quickly and that it doesn't reoccur. So you don't move someone into permanent housing and then they end up just back homeless again six months later. And so that is also what the definition is trying to get at, something that is rare, brief, and doesn't reoccur for individuals. Got it. Um, and I've got one more and then I'll hand it over to Alex. Um, you know, a lot of people in, I think there's a lot of pessimism in, uh, and cynicism in the, in the Oregon political world about quote, solving homelessness. Yeah. Um, so can you point to a, a case study or two where you've seen uh, ending homelessness or, 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 or where community solutions has demonstrated like widespread, maybe surprising levels of success that might um, kind of instill some hope in this in the cynics in the Oregon politics world. Yeah, well, first I'd say it's not community solutions; it's leaders like Lori and teams like teams in Portland that are ones that are implementing and operationalizing this work and driving results. And like I said, we have 14 communities nationally that have ended for one or more populations, but 45 among the hundred that we work with that are seeing reductions in homelessness. Um, some that, you know, that feel very similar maybe to Portland in size and, and complexity are places like Metro Denver, which is actually, um, you know, multi-county, um, multi-city uh, jurisdiction that is trying to bring together many, many players to drive reductions. And over the last several years, they've seen sustained reductions in veteran homelessness when they really focused on that population and on building a system um, that's designed to get reductions in homelessness rather than just individual outcomes or programmatic outcomes. Um, you've got places like Washington, D.C., who also is a very dense, very complex environment in a regional context with um, lots of other communities around it that are seeing high rates of homelessness who've driven um, sustained reductions and, and veteran homelessness and other populations are seeing really incredible outcomes. So I think 
this uh, pessimism that you talk about that it's not possible. I think places like Port Portland leaders like Lori and others that are really trying to move the conversation to what will it take in our context and how do we bring the resources and the, um, the will to really hold ourselves accountable for those, out those outcomes. Awesome, thanks. Alex? No, that's interesting. And I wanna talk a little bit about the technology itself, but before we get into that, uh, and pl please correct me if I'm right, but I believe that the technology investment so far for your solution in the Portland area has been around $10,000. I think that's what the Willamette Week article had said, that there was a, a grant basically to be able to access it for around that amount. Uh, that uh, And I, I actually work in the technology space and I saw that your platform was built on Salesforce. I do Salesforce consulting, so that allowed me to kind of nerd out a little bit. Uh, but my the sort of premise of my question is, I think what's interesting about what you guys are doing is the the solution itself or sort of the ability to help get to that solution is built on technology, right? And a lot of the uh, current solutions, I think that for what government employees in most places are very lacking when it comes to tech. Uh, what was sort of the onus behind you know, I, I'm just curious, of like, what was the idea of coming up with this as a platform, right? Like, it's not like there's a million different organizations that are trying to address homelessness, I think, by providing goods and things like that. But I think you are one of the first groups I've seen that has actually tried to build a technology solution to this. Uh, so what was kind of the, the thinking and the foresight actually behind that? So let me, um, maybe let me correct some misunderstandings about the technology piece. And Lori, please jump in. I'll, I'll start from Community Solutions perspective and maybe you can correct things at a local level. So when I was sharing earlier about the definition of what it means to end homelessness, what's implied in that definition, um, as I mentioned, is that a community has full line of sight across their geography around everyone experiencing homelessness. And as you all probably know, and I'm sure as your community feels, homelessness is a very dynamic um, challenge, right? It's changing all the time. It's humans moving in and out of systems all the time. And it, that makes it really challenging to get your arms around and understand the inflows and the outflows and the system dynamics of how homelessness is moving in a community. But what we have found is if you're gonna hold yourself accountable to a measurable outcome, the very first thing you have to do is have full line of sight into the dynamics of homelessness in your community. How many people are coming into homelessness every month? How many people are homeless in, in a given month in our community? How many people are exiting either because they're being permanently housed or because they're moving home with family or because they're moving out of the city? And all of those dynamics help a community understand where the leverage points are to solve it. And one of the things our sector really hasn't been equipped with over the last couple of decades is our good data systems that help you make strategic decisions to drive results. We have a lot of data systems that are focused on um, administering federal or state or local funds and tracking the outcomes of those funds for good fiscal responsibility and to ensure the resources are being effectively used. Um, but the data systems really weren't set up to make um, strategic decisions about population level reductions that are focused on individual outcomes or, or grant administration. And so when we realize, like, in order to measure if you are ending homelessness, you need to have this real time, person specific, comprehensive view of people moving in, in and out of your system across the community, then the, ne the next thing is like, okay, where will we store that information? And uh, the answer, while, while trying and failing a lot of other solutions, which I'd be happy to talk about, the answer was uh, helping communities use the data systems they were already required to use by HUD, um, which is called the Homeless uh, Management Information System. It's not ideal by any means because it really wasn't designed to do what we're talking about, um, about measuring um, population level outcomes or inflows or outflows, but communities are making that system work because it is actually where they need that where information is already stored. Um, and so that is the work that we do with communities is how to make those systems that you're already required to use really work for um, giving you business intelligence to make good strategic decisions. Um, but Lori, maybe you can talk about how that works specifically in, in the Portland area. Yeah, and I think you saw me kind of reacting in the background here because in my head, this isn't much of a tech solution at all. I mean, we're using most of our own tech. This is a systemic uh, way, a way of looking at our 
actually, a better way to put this is, I think this is process improvement. So it's how often you, you collect data, how um, globally do you collect data? How do you evaluate the data? There's a little tech in there and that um, effectively you're getting us some measurement tools, some run charts. I mean, I don't think, and please feel free to correct me and I don't mean this to sound accurate. It's nothing that we couldn't have done with our current tech. It just gives us advice on how to use evidence-based practices to look at our tech and utilize our tech more effectively. And I've often said that this feels like if you've ever used worked in quality assurance or improvement, like a massive QA, QI process. We're looking at data collection, data utilization, and data upkeep, right? And a lot of the special sauce actually, for want of a better term, of of Bill for Zero doesn't seem to be in the tech at all, but rather in the utilization of the tech and in the mm. follow-up to the tech. So once you have it, you're gonna need to case conference, you're gonna need to connect people, you're gonna need to analyze the data to see your gaps and services. These are things that I think we already do, but this has a really clear set of um, competencies that can direct us toward how we process and prove. Do you think that sounds like a fair evaluation? So. Yeah, you couldn't okay. have said it any better. And I, I just to double down on something you said, which if all that information doesn't really matter if you aren't using it to change what you're doing mm -hmm. or to look at what's working and, and scale that or what's not working. Is the needle moving in the way that we thought? And it is completely just to, to expand on what Lori said, um, the insight we had as we launched Built for Zero in 2015 is that we needed to move away from seeing homelessness as a technical problem. That it just, we just needed more money or we just needed more housing and really embraced that it was a complex problem and that that required our, our sector to have new problem solving skills. So we looked at other sectors like healthcare where they're really using quality improvement to drive better results for people and for populations. And that became one of our theories about how we would effectively move this work forward in our sector is to really, how would we embed quality improvement, user-centered design, good facilitation, uh, data analytics more effectively into systems that we're already working for people to see an improvement over time and to create a better way to see if all of these investments and programs and housing are adding up to fewer people experiencing homelessness over time. And if they're not, then we have this opportunity to learn what's working or what's not working, test new things. And there's no silver bullet, right? If there mm -hmm. were, people would already have ended homelessness. Like this is about how quickly can a community learn from itself and use that learning to change their behavior. And I think that's what the information is for. It's not data for having data sake. It's not data for research or data for judgment. It's data for improvement. Gotcha. So Lori, maybe this will be helpful for, for the audience. Could you walk us through an, like, like a, just a short case study of, you know, you have this set of data, now you're using the tool, it's helping you make better decisions. Like, can we put a little bit more, uh, you don't have to use real names, of course, or anything like that. But I think kind of like a, a real example would be helpful just to kind of hear it a little bit more in depth. Well, so to be clear too, we're still in the process of building our quality binding list, so we're not in the utilization stage. So I might not do that for you like you'd like, but I think the, the difference how it might look is, so currently we put a bunch of information in, in, in HMIS, so the Homeless Management Information System, and where we might use it for case conferencing is we would do it around something we call coordinated entry, which is trying to basically create a list of people who need housing and analyze them on vulnerability and get the most vulnerable in the housing. So that's how we might do it. And we would do it for a very small set of people, right? How we might be looking at this differently with Build for Zero is we're going to be collecting information on more people, right? So more people are going to get into this system. We'll have more people to um, prioritize for services and for housing. And to be clear, this needs to happen in tandem with housing, right? So like, we're using that information. And then in real time, we, um, the more, where it might be helpful is we have really clear expectations and competencies about updating it more. So we're going to know what's going on with that person um, and we're not going to miss an opportunity. Um, one example I like to use is um, Bill Frisero has really clear um, expectations around having clear articulated um, uh, inactivity policies, they call it. So this sounds like a really wonky and uninteresting thing, except for really you're saying when do we take people off the list? When do we put them on the list? When do we like, when is somebody no longer somebody that we're prioritizing for housing, right? And so us understanding, for example, that somebody is in jail and we're not going to inactivate them, but we're gonna to continue to do in reach. So when they come back onto the streets, we can immediately house them is something that could happen as the result of an updated policy. So I realize I'm speaking in broad terms, but basically you're 
setting really clear expectations to allow us to use, utilize, our, utilize our data just a little bit more effectively. Um, and I don't know if that helps paint a picture, but the idea is that we have a better idea of the scope, more people on the list, and then also we're able to much more quickly figure out who's out there and coordinate across. The other example I could give is some of the competencies with Built for Zero are gonna ask us to organize around our outreach a little more clearly. And, and when we get into this, we can talk about how that's really the big challenge here in Portland. Um, but right now we used to do that, we've done this with um, a veterans by name list, like getting people to services and making sure that agencies are coordinating across each other can be complicated. And utilizing data and also clear outreach expectations might be that organization A can say, you know, this person would be better served because they recognize as being a member of the tribes by the Native American Resource Association, which is, you know, which is, or, or, you know, which is, a, and we can get them to you. Or we've been trying to house this person and so have you, let's work together. So it, I think that's where this, this is something we're already doing, but we're going to be doing in a more robust fashion, which means we'll be reaching more people, which will be especially valuable since we also currently have this Portland Metro bond to create more resources. So it's sort of like we're opening the store and then creating better triage at the same time, if that makes sense. That does make sense. Um, so really quickly, uh, I have a question about how this came to be in Portland, and then we'll talk about some of the specific uh, comments, questions, topics of the article. Um, the article mentions, I think it was Dan Ryan, uh, Portland City Commissioner who like discovered um, uh, community solutions at a conference, but it says uh, Mayor Ted Wheeler and Commissioner Sharon Myron from the county were both um, instrumental in in making this happen. But can you give us an overview? I'm not sure, Lori or Beth, who who is better situated to answer this question. But what is the origin story for how community solutions um, became embraced by uh, local decision makers um, in the Portland metro area? Lori, I'm happy to let you lead on that. Okay, I was like, you might know part of this um, as well as I, but uh, effectively, yes. Yeah. So um, we formerly had our uh, uh, continuum of care board named a home for everyone. And when uh, commission, the various commissioners that you mentioned became aware of this, effectively it was introduced as a motion to our coordinating board to um, vote on and the board voted that we should take this on and um, the joint office takes direction from the board. So <laughs> that's how that ended up happening. And so um, so with that, um, I think it also, I, this is, a, I guess, a good opportunity to correct um, some of the timelines on that. Once it was voted on, we actually started working with Community Solutions mid-summer and had an agreement um, in signed agreement by the beginning of September. So we were already negotiating our work in that time. Um, and it took a little time to get on board because we had to go through some legal and such, but we, we jumped in pretty quickly. And then since then, we've been working towards um, developing this quality finding list, as, as we've mentioned. So that's it's not you know, you know a thrilling origin story, but that's kind of how it came about. <laughs> no, no, that totally makes sense. Um, and then, okay, sorry, one other logistic logistics kind of question. So yeah, Alex mentioned the ten thousand dollars thing, which seems like an incredibly small amount of money. What exactly is the exchange of services and like what is the agreement, the contract between community solutions and the joint office? I, I can speak. I'm not sure, Lori, please speak up on the ten thousand dollars. I'm not sure what that's in reference to. Um, but usually for community, any community who's going to join Built for Zero, um, we ask them to make at least a one year commitment um, and and the kind of tuition to participate for that year is $10,000. And then anything after that first year, there's no, no fee, there's no cost, and you can work with us as long as you want to. Um, and so that's the, that's that's the usual agreement for, yeah, yeah. Wow. And so that's, it, and it's, you know, if, if that is, it's really whether the community wants, has seen value in that in the first year and really wants to continue. Um, it's really a partnership between us and the community to say, we're all kind of figuring this out and running alongside each other. Um, and I don't know specifically in Portland whether that, that's the $10,000 that they're speaking of in the article, but Lori might know more than I do. It looks like Lauren clarified that that's the Bill for Zero sign-on fee that we paid for Portland, so specifically. And I mean, what that's kind of looked like for us in technical terms since then is um, I want to just say robust TA and cohorts. So like we, we have um, a lead from Community Solutions that helps to um, initially, I felt like almost project manage, but now just provide technical TA as we try to navigate through the process. Um, and it also means that we have access to their co um, 
like cohort meetings that we go through where we can brainstorm and also hear how other um, other cities in similar positions are going through the same process at the same time. So um, that's the, the majority of it. I feel there's also a little bit of tech TA where there will walk through their programming so we can map our, our uh, data to their tool. So that's been going on at the same time. So those are kind of the two streams that we've been working within um, after signing that scope work. Yeah, and the thing I'll add is that um, that ten thousand dollar going to sign on fee to to join Built for Zero in the first year. Um, one of the great assets that uh, Portland and the region has is the commitment of health system partners, um, including Kaiser Permanente, who's a strategic partner of ours. And so Kaiser Permanente actually covered that fee for Portland. So there was no direct cost to the Portland community of joining Built for Zero, um, and. Not, not only Kaiser Permanente, but all their health system partners I know that are really at the table and helping to um, figure out how they can support building these systems. And we've seen in other communities where that alone can be an incredible resource, these anchor institutions that are really willing to direct their political will, their resources, their support behind um, a focused system that can drive reductions in homelessness. Yeah, and they, in fact, it's worth mentioning they're not on this call, but I believe it's Washington County that is doing a healthcare pilot where they're involving Kaiser directly in the planning of Built for Zero, not just the work. So they've actually been trying to figure out how to utilize more health service planning in tandem with building their um, quality by name list for chronic individuals experiencing chronic illness. Well, yeah, and I just sorry, I just wanted to add that, you know, just for context, that Portland is actually one of five Oregon communities that are part of Built for Zero. So I think mm -hmm. while this isn't unique in Oregon to Portland, um, those communities actually came in before Portland did. Um, and so it's really exciting that not only is Portland part of a larger community of 105 um, communities nationally that include 20 large cities that are very similar to Portland, but also include five other communities that are part of their own state that I think there's going to be a lot of learning and, and connection across those communities as well. So that that is super helpful. And as a Washington County resident, I'm excited to hear uh, about that work in Washington County. Um, I think for if our, I'm, I'll be a listener advocate here and say, if I'm a listener to this podcast so far, it would be hard for me to understand where controversy has come into play here. Um, so I want to bring into this conversation some of the, the in, like in the Oregon politics world, what everyone has been talking about is this like list idea and whether or not like having a list of um, people is, you know, dubious or unethical or a slippery slope or whatever, um, which is funny because as we've talked about, this is like, a, potentially already some version of this already exists, and B, it's kind of like besides the point. Um, the example I've been thinking of uh, as we were talking today is like I'm from the education space. So, you know, all of our SPED students are identified as SPED so we can give them special education services. All of our TAG students are identified as TAG so we can specialize their instruction and enrichment opportunities to meet their rate and level of learning. And so in some ways, this kind of feels similar to other government lists, which we don't really think of as government lists, but we classify um, people based on their needs. Um, but to sort of provide the, the arguments that were lifted, people made comparisons to like really horrific examples of government lists, like in Soviet Russia, um, in Nazi Germany, et cetera. And this, I think this fear of like, will these, these lists be misused to somehow harm people who are on them or to somehow not um, or, you know, force people out or, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the specific fears are, but, you know, um, multiple high profile people have raised this. So I'm wondering if you can respond to the folks who are concerned about um, these, the privacy of these individuals and them potentially being targeted by being on a list. Um, how would you respond to that? And, and, and what, what would you, how should they be thinking about it? I'm happy to start just from a national perspective. I think, um, Ben, the example you gave from education is my guess is you were also aware if you had a student who was experiencing homelessness, that they were homeless and therefore needed some help being housed, right? It's about, do we have the information we need to meet individuals' needs and ensure they're getting the right housing and services they need to end their homelessness? And I think we know from when I first started in this sector in you know, the late 90s, um, a lot of homelessness was incredibly anonymous. You know, We didn't know everyone who was out there. And homelessness is deadly. 
Um, it, people with, who are experiencing ho homelessness, sheltered and unsheltered, have very high mortality rates. And so this idea that it would be better to not know who people are puts those people in even more vulnerable positions to not get the help that they need. And so um, the, the, the effort to really have full line of sight across the community and everyone to understand everyone experiencing homelessness is both to make sure an emergency response way we're meeting those individuals' health and housing needs. And then in a kind of general accountability way, we understand if we are reducing homelessness or not. Are there fewer people experiencing homelessness this month than last month? And there's no way to do that unless you are looking at by name information. And I think, especially in the last five years, the sector has also asked the question, are we getting equitable outcomes? Are people of color disproportionately being left behind in these systems? And unless you have person-specific information, you can't look at that kind of data. You can't make informed improvements to your system. Um, the kind of information that communities are, are um, have in their HMIS systems is informed consent. Okay, individuals are signing off that they, you know, they give consent to have that information and they can revoke consent at any time. And so it's just like any other information that you choose to share with someone, you have the right to revoke that at any time. And I think people working in the homeless response system are some of the people who care the most about people's privacy and their well being. Um, and the intention is to really ensure we can move those people out of homelessness as quickly as possible and ensure that people are known to us um, and, and not anonymous and lingering in in the street or in shelter longer than they need to. Uh, but Lori, I'd love to hear from Portland's perspective on that. Sure, and I actually might complicate this conversation a little bit, so I'm gonna go there. Um, so yes, first I do wanna affirm that one of the reasons we're making sure that this is truly seated in HMIS is because there are some pretty meaningful privacy protections in there, and we wanna make sure that everybody whose information we're gathering really does have the protections that Beth was referring to. But I also wanted to know, you were referring to the education system and tracking who gets um, educational needs, but I, I mean, people do consent to these IEPs and, the, and these tests, and there is an, an elementary, an elementally, um, transactional nature to what you're describing being that you give them information and they get services. So one of the things that's been missing in the past is, and I think this is a surprise to no one, um, we have more homeless people than we have housing right now. We just do, and we're building the housing and we need to, to make this information useful. But, and so in the past, we've been collecting information for people who we can give services to, where this will be expanding and is complicated. And we're having to kind of develop this as we move through it is we're going to be asking people for information that we might not be immediately able to house, right? And I think that's just a reality because, I mean, you've seen the point in time, yet, there's a lot of people and we do not yet have the functional zero level of housing that we need to house the people. So it, it is potentially fundamentally traumatizing to ask people for information and details and not be able to do anything for them in the same way you would never say, can I have all your information, but never mind, I don't, I don't want to help you. We don't want to do that. And we also don't want to imply in any way, shape or form that someone has to tell us something to get basic needs or to develop a relationship with an outreach worker, because most of the holes in our information systems are people who are not currently accessing services. So one of the things we're trying to design right now is a way to make sure that what you just described makes sense to them too, right? Like we build this relationship to move you towards services, but it's not, um, I mean, we're talking about people who are used to a lot of broken promises, right? And the last thing we want to do is create an information exchange that builds upon that history, re-traumatizes, especially people who already are stigmatized on a regular basis. And so knowing, you can think of it a couple of ways, knowing about people's vulnerabilities also gives way to a lot of things that people judge, right? So we're, we're, we're having to design, and actually, I think we're going to talk about this in a bit, what's next. We're designing sort of what is that community outreach process look like that gathers information from a larger group of people who were not immediately ready to serve, right, in a way that is not dehumanizing, right, and in a way that is transactional, but um, not falsely transactional. And I think that's where actually Portland's had some concerns and issues and where I think people arise, because if you have a system where everybody's in a shelter, you're getting their name when they walk in the shelter, you have a transaction. If you're housing them, that's the transaction. But here we need something that makes a little more sense so that we can gather information in a trauma-informed way. 
That's super helpful and super interesting. Um, I've got one quick question. You, this is the first episode we've done that's basically exclusively focused on um, homelessness. So um, I want to ask a, a question that I think is important for people in the political space to understand. This was mentioned a little bit in the article, but I'm hoping you can explain for, for listeners. Um, you mentioned, um, Lori, the, the point in time count. Uh, can you explain what that is and why folks in the homelessness service world find that problematic? Sure. So um, the Housing Urban Development, who funds quite a bit of our services, but not all, thanks to this Metro One, now um, mandates that you do a point in time count. And really, it's a snapshot on a particular day of the year or sometimes a week of the year, which is kind of how we do it, where you basically talk about every single person you see on the street and you report them to get a scope. And it's intended to be an aggregate with some demographic um, and detailed information so we better understand what the homeless problem is. It's problematic for a lot of reasons. One, it's a day or a point in time count. So obviously, as we were describing, this is a situation that evolves rapidly. Um, it's It happens in, not by people necessarily who are doing services 100%. So that, that also has some complicated um, information. People don't always answer completely. Um, and just in a lot of ways, it might give a vague idea what the scope of the problem is, but there's still like any point in time information holes in the system. Um, built for zeros tended to be more um, holistic and more comprehensive than that. But in order to design it well, you also don't want to subject people to what feels like continuous point in time counts, right? Like you're utilizing the information. So I think that's where this differs. Um, we did one last year and we just uh, published the results. Um, a lot of groups that have been doing point in time counts for a while have found it complicated, especially in the time of COVID trying to find people where they used to be, people move, you, you can do the math. So um, so I think the idea of this is if this is a more dynamic data set, we're going to be able to over time compare data and have a better idea of how many people are out there. That's super helpful. Alex? Hey, sorry, just one question about that point in time thing, because I had no clue about that. That's really interesting. One, the it, that just, uh, that, Sorry, I'm a little baffled that that's actually like a government process that is done that way. Is there any parameters around that? Like, does do San Francisco and Portland do it on the same day or something? I'm just curious because you could pick a random day. It could be really hot or really cold or it could be really mild outside. And that would, I imagine, dramatically change your results, right? Yes. So there, the there's, there, yeah, there's a time frame you have to do it with it. Um, you don't have to do it on a particular day generally. And I think in the tri-county, we all tried to pick the same day. So we weren't getting overages in different areas, um, but you exactly what you just described. So we, you don't need to do a street count every year. You can do it every other year. And we pushed it off because of COVID last time. And then in the end, we actually did a point in time count on a day that had a very high level of COVID around. So we also had problems with getting people to do the counts, et cetera. You're right. So that's one of the vulnerabilities of the point in time count. I think Simply, there hasn't been a described better way to figure out exactly how many mm -hmm. people are on the street um, up until now. There are groups that have, and I won't get into annoying details about um, exactly how many different um, sampling methodologies and things you can sometimes do to kind of get better ideas of what's going on out there, sort of melding what you know with what you don't know. Um, but but effectively, yes, this, this is a, a mandated process that every city in the country does around the same time of year. Okay, that's it. And that I imagine has some determination with uh, HUD dollars and things like that and grants that are given out. Exactly. And some of the questions that you asked might inform like if, you're, if your population's gone up or gone down, you know, et cetera, like how many, uh, and then there's also percentages of people who have certain conditions and so on and so forth that also might um, have an effect on your funding and other types of, of information. For example, there's some other governmental grants that use uh, like percentage best PMI, people who have a uh, mental illness, for example, right, to, to mandate some, some funding as well. Interesting. Uh, okay, so I want to ask one more question. And then I, I did, you, you queued me up perfectly, Lori, for the what is next question. I just want to ask one question before I ask both of you that. Uh, one of the pieces of criticism that was received about the program uh, was great. We have better analytics now. We have business intelligence tools that could potentially help us make better decisions. But what does that matter if we still have a, a lack of housing or we don't have enough funding or we have, you know, various other problems? Uh, I, I don't necessarily find that to be a fair criticism because uh, 
I mean, you could take that criticism really about any program and say, well, why should we try this? Because this is already bad. Uh, but I did just want to bring that up and give you a moment to respond to that also and get your thoughts on it. Shall I jump in? <laughs> Which is, they're right. I mean, data cannot house people. I mean, like you need housing to house people. Um, that's that's like saying a tool isn't effective if it's not the only tool that you need. Like, I mean, it's it's a tool in our toolbox and it's a tool to help us do things hopefully more effectively and efficiently and to plan more, uh, more appropriately. But no, I mean, we can't build a list and not build any more housing and expect people to be housed. And hopefully um, this tool helps us illustrate exactly how much housing we need. Portland will once again be at a standstill if we don't continue to create more affordable housing and more supportive housing. And, gotcha. none, of the, and none of the money involved in this is like being rerouted from like construction of new housing, right? Like this is a, a very small amount of money that the, 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 the city and county are, are putting in um, and be like to, to Lori's point, the way that I'm starting to understand this is this actually could be a tool that could attract more or new resources to the table to say, hey, we actually can solve this problem, but here's exactly what we need to solve it. Um, so yeah, I think that actually makes a lot of sense. Sorry, Alex. Oh, no. And then, yeah, I did want to ask sort of both of you uh, the going forward question, which I think looks a little bit different. So Beth, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, but I'll, I'll cue the, both the questions up at once. So with any sort of technology tool or business intelligence tool, there's always a first version, a second version, third version, et cetera, right? Usually these products tend to evolve and get, get sort of better over time. Uh, I'm curious in terms of the, the built for zero of, you know, do you feel like you're kind of at the, the final stage of the product or is there an ongoing roadmap that you all are excited to roll out over the next couple of years? And then Lori, I know that the, the city is just kind of, as you said, you haven't even really started to utilize the tool and do the work yet. I'm curious from your perspective of kind of where you see this going over the next year or two and kind of what the outcomes are that you're hoping to achieve with it. But Beth, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll have you right after Lori. Yeah, I think, you know, at the at the root of what we think will help end homelessness nationally is iteration, right? That's how we're going to solve this problem is by continually learning um, and improving over time. And that applies to every tool and system that Built for Zero and Community Solutions uses as well. And so we've seen even over the last seven years, the kind of initial um, quality data standard we rolled out has been improved and iter iterated on continually in partnership with communities. Things, questions around equity that you know five years ago weren't part of the data collection process are now there because we've learned more and we know more and we're doing better than we were before. So I think that is actually the, the challenge we have, especially um, when we partner across public and private um, organizations, is how do we um, stay true to this idea that we'll solve this problem only through iteration and continually learning and not resting on our accompl accomplishments. Um, and so we would expect any tool. Um, the Tableau dashboards that we provide for communities have evolved incredibly over time. We used to use um, Google Sheets <laughs> and dashboards that we created in Google Sheets. And luckily, this incredible partnership with the Tableau Foundation that has allowed us to um, give this tool and resources to communities at no cost because of that investment. And I imagine those, that will continue to evolve. Um, so I, I only hope our, our understanding of data systems that can accelerate process, progress to zero um, will improve. I think to, in the past, technology has been more of an obstacle to communities ending homelessness than it has been an accelerant. And I think one of our uh, strategic aims is how do we ensure technology is driving, um, is clearing the path for communities not standing in the way. Lori? Uh, so, yes. So for us, um, well, I think I've already described a little bit that we already collect data in certain circumstances. And what we've determined when we're moving towards building our quality by name list is that most of the data gaps are going to be found in um, our outreach process, meaning that we don't generally collect information prior to housing placement services from outreach if we don't yet have that kind of relationship. So what we're doing right now um, is designing a tool and a process to collect that data. And so what's next for us is frankly um, a pretty robust 
robust community engagement process that centers the providers and the people who are going to be doing the work um, to try to figure out two things, what this tool would look like to make it useful to the people who do that work and um, how they might want to utilize it. And a lot of the policies and processes will come from that question, which is what do you need to know other than basic identifying information to clarify this, per this person is homeless, that they're chronically homeless, et cetera. What do you need to know to help them get to housing? So we're working on that and it's, it's not the quickest process, right? We want to make sure that we're really designing something that is effective, but then also doesn't stand in the way of the relationships they're building. So we'll be developing a tool that's basic, that's not a barrier to getting care of hopefully something that'll help them along. So in community engagement, um, developing a framework to huddle around this, uh, this data, um, and then also considering, although we won't know until we do it, what kind of what kind of resources we're going to need to do the case management attached to that. Because I think a lot of people are thinking, we'll have this list and then we're good. But I mean, I think that's when the work, real work begins <laughs> because we have this list and then we need to use this list and continuously update this list. And that's a pretty um, a pretty heavy lift. So making sure we design that in with the people who have to do the work in mind is really the only way we can think of to make sure it actually sticks and continues along. So if it feels like we're kind of crawling, I think it's because we're really trying to design it so that it can be so yes, so about, we're about a couple months away from finalizing some policies, and then we'll be moving into that community engagement process pretty rapidly. Awesome. Well, Beth and Lori, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and, and um, talking us through this. I feel like I learned a lot in the conversation. I hope it was useful for listeners as well. Our final question um, before we let you go, and I'll start with Beth. If folks want to learn more about community solutions or built for zero, or they want to follow your work, where would you direct them? What's the best place uh, to go? Well, uh, Beth and Lori, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and having this conversation with us. Um, it was super useful for me. I hope it was helpful for the listeners as well. Um, before we let you go, our final question, and Beth, we'll start with you. Um, if folks want to learn more about the work that you're doing or track the work, what's the best place um, for them to go to learn more? Uh, I would direct them to homelessnessissolvable.com. Perfect. And Lori, same thing on the uh, joint office um, at the local level. Where could folks go to learn more about what's going on or to be in touch? Absolutely. So um, we, on our Multnomah County website, we also have a particular tab for Built for Zero that has ongoing progress reports as well as briefings and such. It's at Multco US J-O-H-S slash news <laughs> slash built, built zero working and homelessness. And there's actually a tab to just go to the main page that would be much easier than probably follow, trying to follow my, uh, my mumbly uh, website. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we will we will try to put links to both of those in the description uh, show notes uh, for this episode, as well as the Willamette Week article that we referenced so folks can read that too. Um, but thank you again, Beth. Thank you again, Lori. Uh, great conversation with you both. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Ben and Alex. Thanks, Lori. Thank you.